It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first uh, invited speaker, uh, Professor uh, Nikos Legotetis. Uh, I usually do not give a lot of uh, biographical uh, information, particularly for uh, incredibly uh, famous people uh, where you can find all of this information on the web and then people uh, make fun of me for not providing biographical information. So I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, Nikos uh, studied uh, both music and mathematics uh, in, in, in Greece uh, and then did uh, his PhD in Germany. Afterwards, uh, he was uh, at MIT and uh, set up his lab um, uh, in, in Baylor before uh, moving to the um, to Max Planck uh, uh, Institute as a director uh, in Germany. Uh, Nikos has made profound uh, contributions to our understanding of uh, brain uh, neurophysiology. Um, for any person who's interested in visual recognition, his uh, review paper on visual object recognition, uh, annual review of neuroscience, I think 96 or something, it's a classic. I think everybody has to read that. He made a lot of, um, uh, he did a lot of work with uh, studying uh, visual selectivity and invariance in the ventral visual cortex. Uh, and then um, uh, I became acquainted uh, with his work also through his uh, uh, discussions with um, uh, my mentor, Christoph Koch, and, and, and Francis Crick. And, and what I think uh, is uh, up to now the, the most beautiful series of experiments to try to elucidate uh, uh, what might be the correlates of visual perception and visual consciousness through a series of very elegant studies uh, uh, examining uh, uh, the responses of, uh, of, of neurons during paradigms such as binocular rivalry and so on. Uh, then uh, many years ago, there were, um, there were these uh, new non-invasive uh, techniques to examine brain function, and there was a lot of discussion about uh, things like uh, functional neuroimaging and what exactly is going on and what exactly are you measuring with these things. And what was really needed was someone who could uh, really go inside the brain and try to figure out what is happening at the biophysical level and the level of neurons when you do functional neuroimaging. So th th this, was, uh, this was not an easy task. It requires someone with... Uh, with a lot of technical expertise, uh, but also the, the courage and the vision to go after these. And so for any person who's interested in, 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 in functional neuroimaging, I think you have to read, again, the classic papers and, and work that Nikos has done, uh, where he simultaneously did uh, functional neuroimaging together with neurophysiology in monkeys. And, and that, that has really, uh, I think it's today uh, the, uh, the, the most uh, serious documentation of, 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 of what exactly, uh, what's being measured by this uh, uh, type of techniques and how these different scales uh, relate uh, to, to each other. Um, I also uh, profoundly admire uh, uh, people who not only because they do great science, but because they also train great, uh, great scientists. Uh, and Nikos has trained a lot of people. I don't quite remember them all. People of the caliber of uh, David Scheinberg, David Leopold, and, and probably many, many others. Uh, um, and, and, and that has um, many, many people, some people who are sitting here uh, also coming from, uh, from Nikos' uh, lab. So uh, I want to just say one more thing very quickly before I give the, the podium to, to Nikos. Uh, I usually don't talk much about uh, politics, but I do want to say that uh, the, the work on visual recognition, on perception, as well as on uh, uh, functional neuroimaging and circuits and, and physiology, uh, to me illustrates uh, that it's fundamental to be able to, uh, if we ever want to understand brain function and cognition, we have to study uh, monkeys. There's no way around that. Uh, I'm extremely fond of the work that has happened and will continue to happen studying uh, worms and flies and rodents. I think we'll learn a lot from that. I myself have done work where uh, every now when we get lucky, we can record spikes from the human brain uh, invasively. But by and large, if we want to understand uh, brain function, we have to study monkeys. There's no way around that. And, and, and I think this has been uh, a uh, 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 perfect example of, of the enormous contributions towards building better AI, towards understanding uh, cognition, because it's one of the most fundamental questions of all time, as Tommy and Eric Schmidt emphasized uh, yesterday, and also for health reasons. If we want to fix brains, we, we, we need to do this. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Nikos, and I look forward to the talk. Also, I should say he's going to be giving two talks, uh, one now on a more uh, didactic level, and then another uh, talk, our first evening lecture uh, tomorrow night. All right, Nikos. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for uh, taking all this time. You make me feel actually guilty 
<laughs> you don't need to waste your time <laughs> with all these introductions. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here just for your own information. Um, this is uh, almost like a hometown for me because uh, I spent several years, uh, I was several years at MIT and then Houston and in both cases ever since I started every single year with Christoph Koch, with Teresa Janowski, with other people together. We were organizing these kind of meetings and I was very happy when actually Gabriel and Tommy Poggio, they contacted me because I just wanted to come back. And what is amazing for those of you, because um, they were, you were probably little kids back then, is that nothing changed in Woods Hole. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> it's an amazing feeling. It's the same thing you think that the, the, the time stopped actually flowing. <laughs> Everything the same, the captain kit there, <laughs> all the restaurants. <laughs> it's, it's totally amazing. I enjoy it and you should try to enjoy it. You'll, you'll see how good it is after you come one or two times here. Anyway, so in the last thing I want to say related to all these introduction things, um, uh, I am actually, the, if you ask me what are you proud of in your life in science, it's the last thing that Gabriel said. I was extremely happy that 38 people from the lab are professors worldwide right now. And another one is coming up there. <laughs> and it's very, very nice to see that people have their own lab, they have their own research lines. They did fantastic job already in the lab and they continue right now. And it's a true pleasure to have this. It was very nice that the conditions permitted uh, the, the free research of group leaders where they could establish themselves because if you mask people all the time, then everything takes time. But if people have independence and they can just do their own research very soon, they are visible and they go ahead. Okay, so anyway, today, um, as Gabriel said, we'll be talking about two different things. You'll see also formally in the slides. The one is um, more like stressing the rationale, why we bother to do certain things, and then going into the specific things of the electrical stimulation and functional imaging. And the other is related, we'll come back to this, to the neural event triggers imaging, where basically you record, and after you record, you try to see, or at the very same time, you try to see what the brain states are during specific events in different structures of the brain. So. The first one is here, and it's called DES, is a direct electrical stimulation in fMRI. And as you're going to see, it can be used very well to map monosynaptic connectivity and corticothalamocortical loops um, because it has certain uh, constraints that we'll go through in this particular talk. Now, the structure that you see here, uh, I'm sure it's well known to you, right? Do you know what you see? Uh, Until. Right? What you may not know that ant hills can be three or four meter high, meters high, and people discovered in Japan, for example, they are uh, colonies with interacting and intercommunicating ant hills. They can go up to 13 to 15 kilometers. So it's an amazing actually structure that is put together by ants. And if you go in there, you can experience it yourself in your own garden. If you have basically a pile of whatever of garbage and you have your own uh, ants and you let them alone for a period of one week or 10 days, and then you go back without disturbing them, you're going to see different interesting structures. And if you go into these, you'll see that it has a complexity that's really unbelievable. You have these huge chambers compared with the size of the human who is doing the excavation. They have been studied extensively for the reasons I'll tell you. Also with uh, excavation casts and different other methods. And all of them, they communicate. And each one of them is, can be used either actually for storage of food or can be used for the queen to rest or it can be used for whatever. It, an amazing complexity. And this, despite of the fact that, as you probably know, there are queens, workers, slaves even from other colonies, but there is no ant leader. Uh, let alone an ant leader that's educated in architecture, you know. Each ant has about 20 internal encoded reactions to stimuli, no control entities, no hierarchies, only time-dependent synagonistic and antagonistic interactions. Now, why I bother? Well, 
you'll see in one or two slides, these kind of organizations have been the center of mathematical physics for years, and people were very, 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 very much interested to understand what exactly guides the behavior of what they used to call complex dynamic systems. The word complex does not mean complicated, but it means that the behavior of the whole cannot possibly be predicted from the behavior of the nodes of a very large network. So you need more information that tells you something about this self-organization of very large systems with tansegrity and all these things that some of you may know with, if you have mathematical or physics background. Now, these systems can be seen very often in nature. These here are the cloud streets. These are basically convection rolls that they go for miles, literally. And these convection rolls are nothing else but rising warm and sinking cold air. And the amazing question that everybody was asking, how can the molecules of the water know what to do and how can they be organized to generate these streets that can go for 50 or 100 kilometers? Then you have actually the snowflakes, you have the sand ripples, and these here, the small selection, is a non-adaptive, each one of them is a non-adaptive complex system. And they are relatively okay to model. People have spent an enormous amount of time trying to understand them, to develop the methodology that you can use then for what you called adaptive complex systems. You see here the fish schooling, the schooling of the fish, it generates all these things. No fish is telling to the other fish what to do. You see the flocking of the birds, and you can see here actually also the um, fish here. I'm sorry, you should, you should. Okay, you should be seeing here, it's an amazing actual bird flocking that makes all these clouds and there is, so if you zoom in and you try to understand what is happening here in, with a small region, there's absolutely no way to understand and infer what is happening in the whole cloud. So these are the adaptive complex systems and as you may know, the modeling of these systems is a huge problem. You can imagine now what happens. These are the very simple examples I could give you. When you go to structures like genomes, and you go to central nervous system and the brain, and the brain, as you probably know, is par excellence complex dynamic system. It has a huge number of elements, billions of neurons and trillions of connections, high structural complexity, massive bidirectional and often replicating connectivity, opportunistic appearance, Everything connects, I mean, this connects here, and then this connects here, but also connects here, even in the hierarchies. You have hierarchy, but you go also against the hierarchy. So people could never really understand the reasoning of certain types of connectivity. You have the uh, ill-defined elementary operational units. What is, a, what is a unit? The only way you can give an answer, it depends on what is your question. So according to your question and what you want to do in this nested hierarchy, you have to determine what is it you consider to be an operational unit. You have small world topology, very, very, very pronounced. Basically, you have huge connectivity in small regions, but then with two or three synapses, you con connect all over the place. A nested self-organization, and what is nightmare for those who want to have a quantitative description of brain structures is what you call network evolution that is initial condition dependent. If you try to examine what is happening in a particular structure and what the dynamics are, according to what the initial conditions are, you can have different paths. So, what do you do? Well, as you know so far, what we do is we work with one of these techniques. Either people use microscopic activity with single neurons recordings and all this stuff, or they use mesoscopic, micro columns, slabs, columns, and you try to understand what's happening with different signals that we'll discuss, uh, or they combine these two things, or they use macroscopic activity. What is really missing is integrating temporal and spatial scales in a way that you can literally take into account the global activity and the local activity when you try to model the evolution and the organization of a particular system. Now, this is exactly the reasons why we bother to set up all these relatively complicated and time-consuming um, methodologies and all the devices. And what we wanted to do, uh, because functional imaging 
can be studied quite a bit, and you can get very concrete answers as to the origin of signals under certain conditions, and also it has very good localization. Instead of using the EEG, where you have basically a lot of ill post problems when you go to subcortical structures, we, we decided to use the fMRI. We built these special scanners for those of you uh, that may not know what all this thing is. The scanners, they come almost naked. They are just basically magnets, and they have a very standard gradient, and they have very standard things. The rest was built in the lab. And one of the big, big advantages that we had uh, was that it is, it is permitted within the Max Planck Society, it was possible to have these uh, machine shops and engineers and infrastructure personnel. So we, within the lab, there was almost a small industrial unit with infrastructure personnel that went into the details and started building what you see around you. And this is a 4.7 Tesla, usually used for anesthetized experiments. This is for behavioral experiments. This is a 70, 30 centimeters. It is used for rats and so on and so forth. Now, the developments, obviously, they were quite a few, and they lasted from 1996 approximately to 1999, 2000, for three, four years. And among all the things were basically the combination of coils, radio frequency coils, of electrodes, of uh, um, chairs, and for and different types of cages for the animals, mock training setups, very specialized electrodes, and most important, the, in the circuits, or they were, we built all the circuits that do the online interference removal. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the basics of imaging. Should, do you know all of you? No? OK. So OK, they, then why don't we just a very simple thing. You put something in the magnet there, and if you want to have local, uh, basically, information, what you do is you apply gradients of magnetic field on top of the static field. And because there are some laws that help you actually know the local uh, intensity and the local, basically, activity with, uh, with respect to the value of the magnetic field, then you can, um, you can just apply those and have for each one of the lines, basically, you have what they call case space, the information that you need to get the images. But if you apply these gradients back and forth, as you realize, you induce currents. If you have electrodes and you have changes in the magnetic field, and these changes are by application of, of currents that go up to 1,000 or 1,100 amps, you know, then the signal that you try actually to measure is at the level of, uh, let's say, 50, 100, or 300 microamps, and the induction is at the level of 50 or 60 volts. So when we're starting, justifiably, a lot of people were telling me, you, you are a master in wasting your time. <laughs> it's not going to work because there is no A to D converter that can get a huge signals and have enough, basically, of resolution to concentrate on a teeny small change. So they said it's not going to work unless you have an online removal of interference. And in the end, it did work because we actually, beyond all our um, enthusiasm about science, we had also good luck to pick people that were extremely good in doing this kind of work. And the online interference works now perfectly. You can have all these huge voltages. You can still hear and see your signals here. I'll show you what I mean here. Here is what you would hear if there was no, there was no removal of the interference. These are the gradients. There's no way to, 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 to hear to anything. You just hear the gradients. If you see the signal, the signal is completely overwhelmed. And basically, what, what, instead of seeing a neural signal, you hear basically the back and forth induction of the gradients. And if you use the interference removal, what you're going to hear is this. There's not a single gradient thing. And if you go to the local field potentials, you'll hear this. And if you go to the spikes, you're going to hear all the spikes. So, so in other words, actually, the whole thing within the magnet during the acquisition of the images can work 100% and can give you a good sense of what the neural activity is at the very same time that you do imaging and you understand what the distribution of up and down modulations all over the brain may be.
So, in uh, other things to develop was basically high resolution things. Among uh, all these things were also the implanted coils, implanted within the bone. And if you implanted within the bone, the resolution you can go, you can get goes to 50 micrometers, and the slice thickness can go from uh, from 1,000 to 500 micrometers. So it's extremely good resolution. If you compare basically the MR imaging, the anatomical one with the nissel and the myelin stage, you can see basically here the granule layers and there are other images um, that are outside of the, of the scope of the talk that they show that you can even see columnar organization with both anatomical and with uh, functional imaging. Here you see an example of functional imaging again with this kind of coils. You see the vessels, you see everything and you see also exactly the layers that are activated under certain conditions. And what we have been doing in parallel to trying to understand basically the signals, we're also trying to understand what you would call the neurovascular coupling, what is the relationship actually of the signals that you see, of the physiological activity, and the structural organization of the vascular system. And this is exactly what you see here. We use the method of vascular casts. You can see here a three-dimensional representation of the local, basically, circuitry. From that, you can model and you can say, basically, what is the extent of the vasculature of a particular microcolumn, what you would expect to see with the principle of local on the activation. Um, as you probably know, um, you don't, in, in the case of the brain, you don't water the whole garden for the sake of one you know, plant, because it would be, right now, the way we are, we have about 20% uh, of the energy of the whole body being consumed by the brain. You can imagine if there was not this specialization in very localized increases, you would not be able to survive more than hours. So, and so with all these models together, you can get a very good idea of what exactly you're seeing and what the constraints and the limitations are. Then we started going into the direction of phased arrays that increase very much the resolution, even in cases that do not have local and implanted coils. And in the very end, we also developed a methodology to have several shanks. Right now, we can have up to five shanks. Each one of them has 16 contacts. You can have 80 electrophysiological signals at the very same time that you are correcting, correcting your imaging data. All this is done with a very careful placement of the electrodes by reconstructing the vascular system and having the target structures. You can go, if you go down to hippocampus or if you go down to the parabranchial nucleus in the pons, you go 55 or 60 millimeters down in the, in the monkeys, and this is going to be deeper also in humans, and you really have to select the path that does not injure uh, major vessels. So, with all these approaches, we can do MRI with uh, transsynaptic paramagnetic tracers, get an idea of the anatomical connectivity. We can do the electrical stimulation of MRI, the neural event trigger of MRI, then we'll talk about tomorrow. And of course, theoretical and model modeling work without it, the, even the, ex the correct, basically, expression of the data is practically impossible. Now, you're going to be two talks, as I said. Um, the one is going to, call, I'll continue with electrical stimulation, and the other tomorrow it's going to be with a neural event triggered imaging. Now, so what can you do with direct electrical stimulation? I hope you all know that the very first thing you can do is, particularly if you, conduct, you combine it with anatomical imaging, you can study brain-wide uh, brain projective fields. So uh, you can search for causalities between global patterns, not just between one structure that is stimulated and the behavior of an organism, but the stimulated side, the global patterns of death induced neural activity, and then perception, cognition, or whatever else you want. Study of motor systems, network plasticity. You know how much people um, did work with, let's say, long term um, potentiation with, with LTPs and all these things. But if you cause changes in the structure, as you know, you are causing also changes in connectivity that goes beyond the structure. So if you can use direct electrical stimulation for causing local changes and you can then examine what are the global effects, surely you're going to learn much more useful things. And insights in the role of diffuse ascending systems, that's a huge question mark, as many of you may know. The neuromodulation is, you know, 
people say neuromodulation, they mean two or three or five things, but it's completely essential because they're overlapping five, six, seven, according to how you define them, neuromodulatory systems, they have overlapping activity, and they modify completely the local responses and the feedback responses in the cortical and subcortical areas. So a way uh, to, to start to understand those, these uh, ARAs, for example, ascending reticular arousal system and all the other systems that we have is to stimulate certain nuclei, whether it is the rafe nucleus or it's the local ceruleus or whatever it is, and then see what are the activity patterns and what effects they have in the behavior, to the behavior. There's the role of thalamus and the generalized thalamus, the basal ganglia from many anatomists has been seen also some communication basically spot that they call generalized thalamus. And the um, global activity again remains basically obscure. Nobody knows exactly what's happening. Um, so direct electrical stimulation of course has been used but has been used in a very, very um, local way and has been, used also, has been used intensively also for clinical studies and clinical applications. You all the very first topographic marks in the, in the motor cortex and so on by Fritz and Hitzig, you may know the very first ones, they were done with electrical stimulation. People have been studying causal links between brain structures and behavior, pathways involved in reward, study of cortical function, studies of how neocortex mediates a range of behavior from target selection to avoidance responses and so on and so forth. In the clinic, these are three out of many things that are right now rely on direct electrical stimulation. Is the deep brain stimulation that you know that has been actually indeed uh, life-saving for Parkinson's patients despite of the problems that you're going to see in a second. The cochlear implants and also the various um, retinal implants they try to build for people that are completely blind and they have a chance actually at least to have an orientation, a visual orientation after having the appropriate implants. Now, the problems that justify also the whole notion of trying to understand in depth what is happening with electrical stimulation, so the problems are huge. And I'll show you here one example. You, you may have seen this. To prove right. that it's most in the brain, I understand. Okay, I just... I'm level at the top of the nose and the ear. And it is connected to a battery in my chest, and in, in my, uh, in the skin of my chest here. And this is controlled. I can control the amount of the voltage going in. I can control the length of time that the pulses and I can identify the number of times per second that it goes in. And I'll turn myself off now. You realize this is not a theater, right? I mean, it's, it's really happening. and slowly goes to the whole body. Now it stops, okay? Now, about 40% of the treated patients, they have all kinds of problems and side effects, from obesity to schizophrenia to everything you can possibly imagine. And this is despite of extensive clinical studies. So for those of you who may be wondering why this is the case, 
you can just read these very nice things in 1975, actually, James Rank wrote in, in, a, in an excellent review. He said, electrical stimulation of the lateral hypothalamus, let's say, is a shorter version of the statement that there was a stimulating electrode in the lateral hypothalamus which affected an unknown number and unknown kinds of cells at unknown locations in the vicinity of the electrode. And now, 2018, the situation is by 80, 85% the same. So it takes quite a bit of work, and this work sometimes has to be also target specific uh, in order to overcome this kind of problems. So what we have been doing with all these projects, that's why the talks, we, the didactic talks, are a mixture actually of developing methodologies and also getting the results, is we're trying for each one of the research subjects to go through what is needed to make sure that the unpredictable part of a particular, let's say, neurophysiological manipulation has been minimized. And in this case, I'm not, I did not write everything we've done. It would take several slides. But the very basic things was, first of all, a biophysical characterization. If you go with your electrodes and you want to understand connectivity, the very first thing you should do, whether you do it here in another lab or in my lab or wherever it is, is to understand what you're stimulating. And the biophysical characterization involves at least charge density function and corrosion boundaries for your electrodes. People don't realize that if you start actually stimulating, a lot of things change the electrode, and in the end, what you started doing has nothing to do with what is really happening after using the electrodes for a certain amount of time. Then you have tissue volume conduction. You have to make sure that the resistivity and the isotropy or non-isotropy is uh, somehow warranted, and you know where you have it. Selection of optimal pulse duration, which is also site dependent, depending on whether or not you have myelinated, non-myelinated neurons, whether you have small cells or large cells. Current sources and optimization of electric pulses within the magnet. And then you have also the tissue volume conduction current spread as a function of pulse strength. You, when you use bolt on top of everything, you want to have a measure of excitability and see whether this excitability that you measure through the bolt has anything to do with excitability you measure with electrophysiological recordings. And last but not least, you, know, you need to know the excitation fields measured with bolt fMRI. So basically, if you have a region and you measure physiologically what the excitation field is, you have to make sure how much and basically smaller or larger the excitation field with bold imaging can be. And to do that, the very first, I'll go through the slides. Whoever has interest in the technical part, I'd be happy to sit with you and discuss as long as you want. Now I'll go relatively fast so we can go out into the actual, into the real part of the, of the talk. So the very first thing to do is, first of all, you should know what is your charge density, which most people, when you do these things, they don't know. They say, well, approximately. There is no approximately, because you have to know exactly what you'll be injecting. So and uh, charge density is nothing but basically the, um, the current multiplied with the time, basically the charge, the Q, divided by the surface of the exposed tip of the electrode. And the formulas are extremely easy for all of you. In the end, you have the charge density basically described in two dimensions, in the intensity of the current and also in the uh, impedance of the electrode. And you see that here. Here is the electrode impedance. And here you see also the current. And now the story is if you select different things according to what kind of electrode you have and how much current you want to pass, how do you make sure that after the first 15 minutes or half an hour you didn't destroy your electrodes or you didn't change their properties? And to do that, we did for every one of the sessions and for every one of the electrode sets measurements of corrosion boundaries. You see here the platinum iridium boundary and the iridium boundary. It turns out the ones that usually used in electrophysiological studies because of a combination of rigidity and conductivity, the ones that of platinum and iridium, they are not appropriate for stimulation. The iridium has very high bounds, corrosion bounds, and you can use it, and you have a five hours or ten hour session, the electrical properties of the electrodes remain the same. 
The very second thing was actually to examine whether or not in the cortical areas you have isotropy or anisotropy in the field. So you can know how basically to model and extrapolate. Uh, I won't go into the details. It turns out that the resistance values in gray matter were comparable along different axes, suggesting that the gray matter is largely isotropic, which is very good. You don't need to worry. But if you stimulate the fibers in the white matter, the resistance depends on the direction. You can see it here in the white matter too. And you have to know exactly which direction you are and what basically the bundles are anatomically in order for you to model correctly the injected current. The most, most important thing is also the selection of stimulation time and of the currents you're going to use. Here for a pulse duration of 200 microseconds, I put together James Rang had done in his figure one in this 75 review, he had a very beautiful basically collection of studies. So I increased them by almost a factor of 10. And if you put everything together, then you have different basically subregions in this domain with currents in microamps and distance from the microelectrode where you stimulate different types of structure. Here you stimulate unmyelinated fibers, here you stimulate cell bodies, here you stimulate myelinated fibers and so on. So for a pulse duration of 200 microseconds and for a current of 100 microseconds, what you're going to be stimulating is what you see here. You'll be stimulating close to the electrode small unmyelinated axons, small cell bodies, then large cell bodies, small, small myelinated axons, and large myelinated axons. You have to take this into account for the correct interpretation of the stimulation that you apply in each one of the structures or brain regions. The, one of the last examples is basically to give you how pronounced, to, to show you how pronounced basically the effects of capacitance within the magnet are. What you want to pass is a current like that here, right? So basically, depolarizing comes first, and hyperpolarizing comes, comes um, as a second. Now, if you apply it without any compensation, what you really get because of the filtering of the capacitive environment is the blue line that you see here, without any compensation. In order to get the initially basically aimed signal, you have to have online compensation. That's another basically direction of electronic developments that gives you the red signal that approximates as much as possible the green signal. So you know you are passing pulses and you are not passing these funny signals that have nothing to do with nothing. You have to know exactly the current spread, as I said, and according to the applied currents, you have different spread functions. And the last two things, you definitely need to know the excitability of the tissue. What is excitability of the tissue? Well, if you increase your current, okay, for certain stimulation, basically part, uh, for the certain length of uh, stimulation pulses, you get usually a sigmoid function. It saturates somewhere here. If you increase the current, if you decrease the current, then you'll need more, if you, sorry, if you decrease the time, the pulse duration, you'll have more and more and more current needs. Now, if you take 40% of the maximum and you go to the currents required, you can get a, here a line that is called the excitability function of the system. What it tells you is basically the threshold current that you need for different pulse durations. At some point, if the duration becomes too long, uh, no matter how much longer you do it, nothing is going to change. And when you go into this basically uh, baseline, you can determine what people call the real base. And two times the real base, basically projected onto the, in, into the pulse duration, it gives you the chronoxy. Why am I bothering to say that? Chronoxy is almost the signature of what kind of uh, neurons and, uh, and uh, axons you are stimulating. It may sound crazy, particularly for a lecture, but uh, it's basically what is absolutely essential and you have to do it if you want to know exactly what you have been stimulating in a given brain structure. So here, if you do that and you compute the chronoxy, not on the basis of electrical responses or spiking, but on the basis of volt, you get the values that you see here in a chronoxy of 221 microseconds. It implies that when you stimulate and are the conditions that you use to do the magnet, basically you activate projection neurons, which is the right thing. You want to do that. And 
With that, you can measure also the extent of the stimulation, and you see that the bold, basically, extent that you measure is only by 2.5 millimeters higher than the one you can measure electrically. So you have a precise, relatively precise definition of the activated volume by looking only at the bold signal without worrying about the electrophysiological underpinnings. So this is what we said we need to know. And this is, the, this is here summarized the findings. Physiology and bolt measurements yield similar current spread profiles. Very important for continuing this work at all. Bolt fields are 2.5 millimeter larger than neuronal fields estimated by spiking activity. The positive bolt responses are due to power increases in various LFP bands, as we said repeatedly in the past. And the negative bolt responses reflect the reduction of multi-unit activity. The direct electrical stimulation induced bold activations have neural origin and you're not stimulating muscles or stimulating something else. So you can use this now and start your true recordings. What uh, we wanted to do is functional imaging of cortical stimulation, see what you're activating when you activate a structure in a system starting with a sensory system, with a visual system, functional imaging of thalamic stimulation that you see here. This does not work. It's OK. All right. And neural basis of positive and negative bolt responses, death effects on cortical cortical signal propagation, and death-based mapping of cortical thalamocortical loops. So here, we bought the visual system. Uh, most of you are familiar with that. Should I go fast or should, who is working with the visual system here? Oh, not everybody. Okay, good. Okay, so then very, very, very quickly, the visual system, the basic pathway is from the eye, from the retina. As you know, it goes to the thalamus, to the lateral geniculate body, and from there, with the optical radiation, it goes back to the cortex. As usually, you have all these double pathways. They are phylogenetically preserved, and they offer actually alternatives to certain type of tasks. And in the case of the visual system, you can have also direct projection to the colliculus. In the colliculus, you can go to pulvinar. And there is a lot of discussion about a small also direct projection to the pulvinar, and so on and so forth. Now, in the monkeys, the story is the same. You go from the I to the LGN and then to V1. And as you're going to see, the only difference is the location of the fovea in humans. The location, as you're going to see in a second, is in the occipital pole, and in monkeys, is approximately between the lunate and the inferior occipital sulcus, somewhere here. So, and the lower here shows a nice combination of the manganese enhanced MRI. You inject one eye, and you get basically the one optic nerve and the optic tract and then the optical radiation. And if you combine it with fMRI, you can see very nicely what the pathway is and what the activations are during visual stimulation. And the right one shows basically visual stimulation in the entire, uh, almost in the entire brain. Um, now, what is characteristic in almost all sensory systems is this topographic organization, whether it's about sounds or it is about basic sensory motor things and so on. There is a mapping of the world in, onto the tissue. In the very, very, very first studies were done by Tachu Inouye, really ingenious person. He was extremely actually young when he did these things. In 1909, he published the Sehstörungen, as the base disturbances of the visual system, where he describes the um, missing capacities of the subjects. They had bullets in the head. In a perverse, crazy way, the um, increases of the velocity of the muscles generated basically spinning um, bullets. And the spinning bullets, they were going so fast and rotating, they were going through the brain, very often melting the vasculature. And you would have a basically bullet going from here in and from here out without dying, but of course with the missing part of your brain. And with this, <laughs> and developments in the world, in the world industry, these people here and later Morgan Hall, Gordon Morgan Holmes, they have the ability actually to see what is missing if you have a very specific damage, almost a topographically basically determined damage in the brain. And what uh, Inouye did, he showed very convincingly that there is a whole map that basically the horizontal meridian is in the calcarine, 
and the upper part is the lower part of the field, the lower part is the upper part of the field. He even noticed differences in magnification. More tissue is devoted towards the foveal areas, less tissue is devoted towards the periphery. And the same kind of studies were done also by Gordon Morgan Holmes, who showed basically these nice maps here. You see how the upper basically right uh, visual fields is mapped. Here's the calcarin that you see here, and how this is mapped on the visual cortex of humans. Now, with monkeys, you have the same business, uh, with the only difference, as I said, instead of having the fovea here, you have it here. And very nicely, you can see in the movie here, uh, if you have a line, and the line is moving in in the V1 and in V2 areas, in both cases, you're going to have uh, basically what happened to this here. Yeah. So, and when it comes back, they're going to go back here. So, this is a precise mapping. Basically, this is the area V1. This is the area V1 here. And this is the area V2. And both of them are moving together uh, along the horizontal meridian. And now, if you map this precisely, you're going to get, as I told you, the left visual field map to the right um, hemisphere. The red shows the fovea for the non-human primates. And the blue shows basically something like 7 or 7.5 degrees eccentricity. Um, and you can have maps, precise maps, that were done also electrophysiologically ever since the Hubel weasel studies. They did very precise measurements where basically the receptive field is in the cortex and what the properties, the local properties are. So, and the same things now can be done also partly with EcoG and human work. So, the retinotopy in the cellular and the functional specificity starts early in the visual systems of all organisms. You have it, of course, in LGN. You see here the LGN with MRI, and here you see basically the horizontal section, and here you see the histological section, and you have on the LGN the, um, it, the way you see these things right is always left. So the, the, um, the Right is left, correct. The right part then is here on the left, LGN, and the fovea is um, in the uh, posterior part of the LGN. And if you see the LGN itself, you'll see it has a very complicated structure, has different layers. The parvocellular layers and the magnocellular layers, these are very sensitive to parvalbumin. You can very nicely label them. And also it has the corneo. Uh, cellular layers that are between the relay neuron, basically, layers in the LGN. And each one of them receives information from different eye. This is from the contralateral eye, then Ipsi, contra, Ipsi, Ipsi, contra. There is a change there in the order. Uh, now, what is important and very relevant to the studies of stimulation and connectivity are the patterns of connectivity from thalamus to cortex, and then the, pat the patterns of cortico-cortical connectivity. And as you see here, each one of these neuronal types projects to different layers in the area V1. The parvocellular projects to the 4C beta, and the magnocellular to the 4C alpha. And the corneal cellular, they project actually to the first, to the top layer, and to the layer 3A. Very characteristic patterns. And they are all aligned for, from each one of the eyes. You have basically adjacent columns in cortex. And this is the reconstruction of ocular dominance columns in V1 and old study um, from, from the 70s. So the orientation columns now in the cortical microcircuits are also critically important in order to understand what exactly has been stimulated during these kind of experiments. Here you see orientation maps. And as you may guess, there is no cortical neuron. It's an island. What you really have for each one of the elementary activities, a coactivation of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, that you see them here, they generate the so-called microcolumns. That is probably the most meaningful way to assess the microscopic level of activity. Now, if you stimulate the input in a microcolumn, what you're going to see is a very brief, basically, excitation followed by a very ra rapid inhibition. And this rapid inhibition is uh, induced by the GABA-A ionotropic receptors. 
If you see what happens before that, there is a slow recovery, and this is basically induced more uh, here inhibition and slow recovery from the GABA beam uh, receptors. And remember this, I'll show that to you again, because it determines exactly what you can do and what you cannot do by using electrical stimulation and trying to understand connectivity. Now, this behavior is dominating the whole, basically, activity in a microcircuit. And the anatomy of the microcircuit, you have the thalamus. Only 10% of the input of the cortical microcircuits is coming from thalamus. The rest is coming from cortical-cortical connections. And it goes to both the GABAergic cells and the glutamatergic cells. Now, what is critical is that both types of cells, they have an, an auto um, enhancement system. You see here there is um, um, an amplification of the signals from of the glutamatergic neurons, and here an amplification of the signals of GABAergic signals of GABAergic cells, and this would uh, actually lead to almost a chaotic, if not epileptic, behavior if you didn't have this control. The control here is such that uh, there is a continuous balance between excitation and inhibition in the circuit. And what is important, and you'll see it also with stimulation, when you first have an input, whether it's come, it comes from the electrical stimulation or from a sensory input, the glutamatergic cells by two to three milliseconds, um, they are activated by two to three milliseconds earlier, and then you have the excitation inhibition balance. This early excitation here cannot be suspended without losing the functionality of the microcircuits. So you have weak feedforward input, recurrence, and long excitation inhibition evolution. And the story is now, according to the connectivity patterns, you can very well determine what is a feedforward pathway and what is um, a feedback pathway. You have three things to summarize. Forget the unilaminar. We go to bilaminar, that's the most frequent. And you have three types of things. You have basically input to the cortex that is going to the granular layers, to the middle layers. And then you have input that goes to all layers of the cortex. And you have input that goes to the bottom and top layers. All inputs like that, they are coming from ascending systems, whether they are unilaminar or they are bilaminar from the top and the bottom layers. All the ones that have basic inputs along the entire column, they come from lateral connections. And the ones that are coming from the top and bottom layers, they are descending feedback connections. And this is exactly what you see in the diagrams that you probably all have seen again and again. Here in uh, monkeys, you can very well see all the areas by unfolding the cortex. And you have these uh, very many areas, the area VP, V4, V3, V2, V1, TF. And you know very well also the diagrams of Van Essen and Feldman and Van Essen. And all these things are based on the connectivity that I show you in the previous slide. So it's not a random, basically, uh, localization of areas, but it's based on their connectivity patterns and determination patterns and whether they are unilaminar or bilaminar. And these two um, pathways have been studied repeatedly when one that has something to do with the parietal lobe is the localization of objects, and the one that has to do with the temporal lobe is basically the object identities. Last thing related to important connectivity is what people keep forgetting all the time. When the relay cells of thalamus, from whatever thalamus they are, they go to the cortex, usually to the granular layers, and then they project actually to the upper layers, and from the upper layers they project to another cortical area. There is a tendency to believe that once you reach cortex, you stay in cortex and you deal only with cortical cortical connectivity. That is not true. What really happens is the layer five that receives information directly and indirectly from layer four projects to associational nuclei, different names in different basically species. In the case of the monkeys and humans, it goes to the pulvinar, and from pulvinar, it goes to the other area. So you have here cortical-cortical, but you have also cortical-subcortical-cortical connections. 
What is important for you to remember is that the connectivity here is with ionotropic receptors. That means it's not modulatory activity, but it's basically passing signals in parallel to having cortical connections. You're passing signals to other structures that process information about uh, external stimulus. And what is also very important is if you have the occipital, here's the cingulate, temporal, and frontal lobe, and you have two uh, maps. Here is the map, for example, in the pulvinar, and here is the map with uh, the cortex. Then every two points that are interconnected in cortex with well-studied uh, studies, uh, they will be connected also through the pulvinar. It's what actually Stuart Chip called the replication principles. If two cortical areas communicate directly, they are likely to have overlapping thalamic fields. If not, the thalamic fields avoid each other. They are totally separate or interdigitating. So, stimulation of visual structures. What are the global effects of direct electrical stimulation in different structures? Is there signal propagation? And what are the direct and indirect effects? We started the stimulation with, uh, with um, the um, uh, stimulation of visual cortex. Here you see the lunate and the occipital, and I told you approximately here is the foveum, and you stimulate here in parafoveal area. What you see is if you stimulate the parafoveal area with all the correct currents that I explained and the conditions that are basically studied specifically for the human, for the monkey cortex, then the activation the induced by the direct electrical stimulation is going to generate a small bald spot, as I said before, that is approximately 2.5 millimeters wider than the neurophysiological activation. And you're going to have the corresponding area that receives information from V1 in the area V2 and also in the other areas that you see, like the area MT. And if you see the responses, the responses are identical to the one you would get with a very small visual stimulus presented in a manner that activates this particular region. Now, if you actually um, stimulate and you reconstruct the spread, you will get exactly what I told you before. And if you see here, I mentioned for the first time, you'll see, despite the fact that even we have been ignoring it in the beginning for a little while, there are red spots and blue, stop, blue spots. There are activations, but there is, there is also a negative bold response. If you go to another cortical area, which we did here in the area MT or V5, then you get the very same kind of results. You have activation of FST that receives direct input from MT, of colliculus that receives direct input from MT, V1, the same story, V2, MST, and so on and so forth. If you put all the stimulated, uh, stimulated areas and the activated, desactivated areas together, then you'll see that um, there is very nice logical, basically, propagation of the activity in both cases. Here's the V1 stimulation and here's the V5 stimulation. But if you check all the areas carefully, you'll see they are all of them monosynaptically connected to V1, which was strange. It would be strange for anybody working on that. So the question that we wanted to answer is, can direct electrical stimulation induce excitation of cortical afferents propagating cortex, or it goes to the first station and then stops? Which hardly makes sense. Well, <coughs> to do that, we stimulated LGN. We wanted to go far away and stimulate literally the inputs to cortex without any potential artifacts because of the stimulation electrodes. And if you stimulate the LGN, which is also retinotopically organized, and you can predict physiologically, also verify which areas you expect it to be stimulated, then you have a visual stimulus, you present it, and you get a spot here in V1, you get a spot in V2, extra stride cortex, MT. And if you have electrical stimulation, you adjust the parameters that you get basically identical, and the identical dimensions for the stimulated areas in V1, in V2, in MT, and so on and so forth. And then the idea is to check what exactly is happening beyond the monosynaptic targets. If you only, uh, if you only plot the positive bolt responses, you're going to get a very predictable, here is the visual stimulation uh, that, of course, stimulates both eyes. And you get in both sides uh, 
you would have central stimulus of certain dimensions. You get stimulation at both sides. And here you stimulate electrically, and you get one side. In all the structures that you see here, uh, they appear to be, again, monosynaptically connected to the stimulated area, but with robust and very precisely defined activations. If you take now the negative bolt responses into account, then you see the following things. The moment you stimulate the LGN, you're going to have LGN activation, superior collicular activation, and pulvinar activation, because if you remember, I told you that there are also direct connections from LGN to colliculus and pulvinar. And then you'll have V1 activation, which is also clear. But then comes the real surprise. You have inactivation of V2, of area V5 or MT. And with XC, I mean here all areas that belong to the extra stride cortex, V3, V4, V4A, and so on. This pattern that I show you is completely independent of animal state. So you can have opiate anesthesia. That's very good because it's sparing all kind of effects on the neurovascular uh, system, except of preserving most of the physiological responses. Or you can have awake animal. You're going to get identical results. The red shows basically the uh, visual stimulation, and the blue shows the electrical stimulation, and in both cases, V1 is going to be activated, and the extra stride cortex is going to have these negative bolt responses. It is also independent of the current intensity. So if you get an end map, basically the voxels that have been stimulated by different current intensities, here is basically 100 microamps, and here you go down to 10 microamps. So if you get basically only the voxels that were activated under all conditions, and you plot them here, then you'll see that for each one of these current intensities, the um, area V1 is going to have these uh, positive activations, and the area V2, or the extra stride cortex, is going to have these negative bolt responses. And here, this summarizes the results. It tells you, basically, if you stimulate LGN, you have, a, you have activation of LGN, of colliculus, of pulvinar, of V1, inactivation of V2, MT, and extra stride cortex. The right plot here shows the validity of each one of the models. You can do it with f -rash, or you can use any other statistical method to see how consistent the positive or the negative responses are. And you'll see that basically, in some cases, the MT is activated, and in some cases, it's deactivated. Here's the MT, and stimulation, basically, of uh, MT, in, in this case, is deactivation. In this case, is activation. And what I told you previously is that the corneocellular system between, basically, the dark regions projects directly to MT. So activation of relay nuclei versus corneal cells. The relay nuclei are the ones that you see here, the parvocellular and the magno, and the corneal cells are the ones that are in the white areas. And the question is, can really the direct electrical stimulation selectively activate the corneal system? Well, to answer the question, we use the usual optogenetics. And if you use the optogenetics, then you can prove very easily. Here is basically the enhanced yellow uh, fluorescence protein shows basically the location of the, of the corneocellular cells. And the parvalbumin shows basically the magno and the parvo cells. If you superimpose them, you see very nicely you can separate these two basically regions, the relay cells from the intermediate cells. And if you see the physiological responses, then the visual stimulus will generate, if you use the current density, basically functions. It's going to use an activation in the granular layers. And uh, later on, in a few milliseconds, it's going to generate also activation in the top layers, because this is the way the signals propagate. If you uh, go to the parvo and you do micro stimulation, you'll get similar responses. And if you go to the corneo system, and you use optogenetic stimulation, you're going to have basically activation of the top layers, as I said. And these top layers also are the ones that project to the, to the MT. Now, the question was, if I electrically stimulate here, after knowing that I'm precisely in the corneo, do I have enough precision to generate the same pattern? The answer is yes. <laughs> 
whether you are using the optogenetics or you, you are using traditional electrical stimulation, if you can determine exactly what the area is, and if you can determine exactly what all the biophysical parameters should be, as I said in the beginning, you get basically identical responses with the ones you would get with the optogenetic stimulation. So when you have basically the activation of the relay neurons, then you're going to have this negative response in MT, as I said. And if you have activation of the corneocellular layers electrically, you're going to have this positive thing that gives this diversity in the responses um, in MT after following the electrical stimulation in the lateral geniculate body. So the same thing with lesions. I'm going to skip it quickly. If you have lesions, you can try to understand also why you see. Yeah. Just to a, a very basic question. All these time courses, that, that's the, the slowness of blood, right? It's not that yes. you're simulating and you have seconds of activity. No, 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 it, no. It's no. blood. Right? It's blood, blood exactly. Blood. It's the, the, what you expect. In fact, actually, you'll see tomorrow. If you know the neurovascular coupling function and you know also the repetition of the events and whether or not they have autocorrelation, you can deconvolve these functions and you get things that are very close to neuron activity. Absolutely correct what you say, yes. And so here, the same story as you see, there is a little bit of a, there are sometimes, most in, in most cases you have deactivation of V2, in some cases you activation, and the reason is why. Uh, well, uh, because there is a direct input to V2 from uh, lateral geniculate body, and the, the, the whole question is when do you have basically prominent activation of this pathway and, and it dominates the activity um, compared to the, to the regular pathway that goes from V1 to V2. And to see whether the V2 alone can generate these positive negative patterns, we used animals that had V1 lesions from other projects. And you see here the V1 lesion. You see here the normal area, the control area. You see the control area in area V2. And also the lesion projections on V2. That means the information of this, the information of this area is coming from the lesion, should have been coming from the lesion area. And if you go now to the normal V2 and you uh, do electrical stimulation, in this combined case, you're going to have increases of activity with the visual stimulation. And the moment you have the electrical stimulation, you have decrease of the activity. If you go to the lesion projection zone, you'll get the opposite. So you see, you selectively activate here the direct pathway from the lateral geniculate body to the area V2. What is important to keep in mind is that the negative bold responses that you see in all these examples, they are not equal to the negative bold responses you experience with visual stimulation. We've known for a long time that if you have a visual stimulation in areas that are not directly stimulated, you have negative bold responses. You see it here and you see it here. So in the positive bold responses, usually in the simple case that there are no complications of the stimulus, they correspond to an increases of the MUA and of course the LFPs, and the drop, they correspond to a decrease of the MUA. Now, this is from lateral interactions, as you're going to see here, and feedback interactions. It has to do with the organization of the sensory systems. If you stimulate, then the very same area that is stimulated is the area that shows also the negative bold responses. And to make sure you examine only these things and not uh, other areas in the vicinity of the stimulated area, you can use this sequential stimulation or sequential combined stimulation where you have a visual stimulus and an electrical stimulus, or you have a visual stimulus superimposed by an electrical stimulus. In this case, in, with a visual stimulus, you'll have a response, a positive response in the V1, and with electrical stimulus, you'll have also a positive response in the V1. And if you use um, the, uh, the, the signal of V2 for exactly the same voxels that have been stimulated by the visual stimulus, you'll have an increase with the visual stimulus and a drop of the activity of the electrical stimulation. The same with the superimposed stimuli. You see here increases with the visual stimulation, then further increase with the area V1 and decrease in the extrastriate cortex. So this summarizes basically the data.
And we go now to the last and most important part. What's the neural basis of all these positive and negative ball responses? Well, here we started doing these experiments with a single stimulation pulse, the way traditional people did for many, many decades. So you uh, go to LGN, you stimulate with one single pulse the LGN, and you record from the cortex. And what you see here is an abrupt, basically, increase in spiking in the area V1, and then there is complete inhibition that recovers slowly. You see t two different profiles of uh, activity changes. And the same here, different paradigms to show you how, um, in, how consistent, but also slightly diverse is. Here you have long inhibition. Here you have a little less inhibition. You'll see now the clustering of these responses. And here you have the excitation. If you cluster them, there are three clusters for all sessions. We're talking about thousands of experiments. And you s these clusters with unsupervised clustering, they tell you that there's one type of response that immediately after the single pulse stimulation, you have um, an inhibition that recovers very slowly. There is another type of response that shows this very brief inhibition. And there is one that shows excitation. As you're going to see, these three things, they are not random, but they occur in different layers. The first one here happens in the, in the projection neurons in the supragranular layers. This is, happens approximately in the middle layers. And the excitatory one happens in the infragranular layers. And the LFP in all these three cases is the same for the supragranular, the granular, and the infragranular layers, and shows why, in the case of the V1, you have a positive signal. Now, LFP increases consistently reflect the input of direct electrical stimulation. What is causing the mu suppression? changes in excitability, adaptation effects, or whatever it is, or is it synaptic inhibition that is coming from inhibitory neurons? Well, one way to examine what is happening is to see the properties, to study in detail the properties of the recovery. And you see here that the single, basically, pulse um, stimulations, they have very similar uh, profiles regarding what the um, intensity of the stimulation is from 50 to 500. And the peak response is not changing much. The time to peak is not changing. And the tau value recovery is also 73%. So that means that most likely you don't have uh, excitability changes, but you have some kind of inhibition that is coming from the cortical inhibitor neurons. The duration of the inhibition here is independent of the amount of charge transfer, is minimally prolonged by a second pulse, and it has no nonlinear non interaction with subsequent pulses. So is negative ball response due to synaptic inhibition? You can answer the question if you use pharmacologi pharmacological MRI, which we did. Uh, you can use bicuculin for temporary blocking GABAergic activity. We put together all the hardware that permits actually the appropriate uh, infusion of substances without uh, affecting the excitation inhibition balance because of mechanical forces. And if you do that and you use any method, unsupervised method like the filtered independent component analysis clusters, then you see that there are certain clusters here. The very first one is the uh, signals over time uh, in the injection zone. The second is in the unaffected areas. As you stimulate, there are going to be some signals there. And the third one is the injection projection zone, is the area that receives information from the blue area that you see here. And here are the signals again, the two signals that are coming from V1 and V2, areas that are unaffected, nothing is happening. And the areas that are affected, you see here, they have also these low frequency changes that are due to the application of the stimulation. Now, if you go to the injection projection zone, before the injection, you have the typical V2 response of inhibition. After the injection, if you block the GABAergic activity in this particular area here, you're going to get this response. So very clearly, when you stimulate, what is happening is the 
uh, activation of GABA ergic neurons that is a little too early, is feed forward inhibition, shuts down the whole microcircuit. And this you saw in the previous slide that I show you. This is what I told you that you have very quick, basically, inhibition. And the, uh, is, is the self amplification here that you see in the circuits can only work if the synaptic delays are respected. So, with electrical stimulation of the cortical afferents, there is no way to do anything without causing this um, involvement of inhibitory neurons that stop the self amplification of the system. So if this inhibits the cortical microcircuits, why does LGN stimulation robustly induce positive bold responses in V1? It's a justified correction. I kept telling you, I kept, I kept showing you the V1 activation, but the V1 neurons are shut down, are shutting down. Well, you'll see why. Let's say in the, the, the stimulation paradigm that I show you the walls with 100 or 200 hertz. What happens if you have very low frequency? You have very low frequency. You have here the basically pulses of the stimulation. And this is the average, basically, uh, under normal conditions, the average spontaneous activity. Now you increase the frequency. Look what's happening. The interpulse activity is increasing because of the incoming input. And you increase more, it's increasing more. It's increasing more. And look where it goes. So. Basically, by increasing the frequency of the stimulation, you generate an interneuronal, whether they are stellate cells or other types of neurons, activation that activates everything, brings it up, and this, of course, consumes energy, and you have both responses. So if you examine now this uh, inter-spike or inter-pulse, basically, activity, you'll see that from 1 hertz is very low, and for 10 hertz is increasing, and above, let's say, 30 or 40 hertz, it starts basically becoming positive. And if you also examine the pulse efficiency, that means the chances that a particular electrical pulse is going to cause an action potential, it is a non-monotonic function of the frequency. It goes down and then goes up again, and here it goes, here it goes above the 50% in the last three cases I'm going to 100 hertz. Now, if you use visual stimulus and you use the bolt, you'll get identical results. Here this is the activation with a visual stimulus. Three hertz is going to cause this basically inhibition in V1, six hertz inhibition, and then 12 hertz and all this in, in V2, excuse me. In V2, you're going to get the standard pattern where basically you have inhibition under all conditions. In V1, you'll have the reversal. Here you have basically inhibition, 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 but here the interspike activity is large enough to produce a positive volt response, and you're going to get the positive volt responses that I showed you repeatedly. So above 40 hertz, you see the public, the positive volt uh, responses, despite of the fact that the neurons shut down, but the incoming signal still dominates. And the summary is shown here with 200 hertz is what I show you again and again. This is the visual stimulus. This is the electrical stimulus. With 8 hertz, both of them in the electrical stimulation, they go down. Um, let me move on because I don't want to take your time. OK, finally, the cortical, uh, where is this? Here, if you stimulate the pulvinar, then you see that the activation goes everywhere. Why? Because of the reasons that I told you, because the pulvinar has this ability actually to connect every single point. And the moment you stimulate the pulvinar, whether basically it is um, um, orthodromic or antidromic, you have activation of both um, areas connected with that particular pulvinar spot. So high frequency direct electrical stimulation demarcates all monosynaptic targets of stimulated brain site. Activation of polysynaptic targets may reflect the antidromic stimulation of collaterals, of in infragranular projection neurons, and the recruitment of replicating pathways. And behaviors induced by this or the TMS, the same thing, likely reflect cortical subcortical cortical pathways rather than direct cortical cortical communication. So before I uh, thank you. I want to 
uh, mention here that the group that works with me together in trying to develop all these methodologies and have the first application is shown here in diverse, um, with diverse background. Uh, people are in from neuroscience or electrical and bioengineering or physics and RF technology, physics, electronics, electrical engineering, and, and neuroscience, of course, NMRI and biophysics. Uh, and finally, there are the machine shop and the electronic shop people that help us build everything that you saw in this presentation, and it permits the application of these uh, multimodal methods. Thank you.